Yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the time of the hour when you're watching this episode and also depending on where you are watching from. This is Beholding Christ and my name is Ben Fetcher and I'm excited again to be here with you so that we can get into the scriptures and dive and get to understand the word of God. This is the third episode of our spiritual warfare and I know that the previous episodes have blessed you and you've enjoyed and you've learned so so much and before we get into the word I would like us to pray then we read the scriptures. Father we are so delighted this day that you love us this much that you have allowed us another opportunity to come and hear your word. We thank you our ears are attentive, our hearts are receptive, oh God. Our minds are ready to be uh, to be renewed by your word, oh God. Because when your word gets into our minds, we are transformed by that renewing of the mind and our lives can never be the same again. And as we behold Christ, we are changed into the same image. Thank you. Thank you for my viewers tonight. Thank you. They are blessed in there as they, as they settle to hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. So, welcome for, for the word. And I would like us to go directly into the book of Ephesians chapter 6 from verse number 10. This is where we left. And uh, uh, maybe uh, going back a little bit on where we were discussing, we talked about Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5, then chapter 6 up to verse 9. That is what we, we learned. And uh, we divided the book of Ephesians into three uh, into three parts. The first part we say is Ephesians chapter 1 all the way to chapter 3. And that in that Ephesians or in that part of the of Ephesians, Paul establishes believers in understanding their position in Christ, in understanding who they are in Christ. And I remember we emphasized on Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 where the Bible says that he has made us, okay, he has raised us up and he has made us sit together with Christ in the heavenly places. And then we went to Ephesians chapter, chapter from chapter 4 verse 1 all the way to chapter 6 verse 9. And we realized that Paul is talking about now, now that you've been I, we have received a new identity now that our sins are forgiven, now that we are raised with Christ in the heavenly places, now that we are seated in the place of, a, of the finished works, now that we are a new creation, now that we are accepted in, in the beloved, and now that we are redeemed, now we are called to walk worthy. If you look at Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 1, Paul begins by telling us, now therefore walk worthy of who you are. So we don't walk worthy of who we are not. We walk worthy of who we are. So the walking worthy part is to is a calling, is an exhortation to live out who we are. Because as a believer, the finality of our salvation, the finality of redemption, the finality of forgiveness, the finality of the new creation, Paul takes time to, to establish us in that reality from Ephesians chapter 1 all the way to Ephesians chapter number 3. Then in chapter 4, he takes time now to tell us, now that this is who you are, walk worthy of it. Then Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10, where we are taking it uh, from to, uh, today, uh, Paul talks about us being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And I remember when we were starting this uh, topic, we said, uh, we actually we started with Ephesians chapter six verse ten, but we realized that it starts with a final thought. Paul calls it as we wrap it up. He also calls it uh, the final thinking, or as in conclusion. So we realized that we cannot start a subject by concluding it. We had to first establish ourselves in the realities of what he was talking about in the previous chapters. So now we have captured the thought of Paul. We have captured the instructions of Paul. We have captured the teachings of Paul. And therefore now we can come to Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 10, where now he talks about our standing position. Remember we said the first part is our sitting position, sitting as a result of the finished works of Christ. Then the second part is our walking position in Christ, walking as a result of our sitting position. Then the third part, which we are taking it up today, is our standing position position. And I say that spiritual warfare, if you can remember, we say that spiritual warfare is not fighting against the devil. And we have not been called to fight the devil. No believer has been called or has been given a mission or an, an assignment to fight the devil. Why? Because 
No one has the ability to fight the devil. All that was supposed to, to be done to the devil, it is Christ who did it. And we can read in the book of Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Colossians uh, chapter 2, verse 15. And we realize that it, is, it was not our work to fight the devil. It was the work of Christ. And he says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle over them, of them triumphing over them in it. So what I want us to see here is that the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the, of the dark world, the devil himself, he has been disarmed with finality. He has been disarmed. The Bible says, having disarmed power, uh, principalities and power. So who has disarmed the devil? It is Christ who disarmed the devil. And actually, he led him into a public spectacle. That public spectacle means a parade. He was taken through a parade uh, to show forth that Christ had to show forth to the world and to the rulers of this dark world that he has conquered, praise God. So the victory against the devil has been achieved by one man, Jesus Christ. So having understood that the devil has been disarmed, then the question comes and we ask ourselves, so if we are fighting, what are we supposed to fight? Are we fighting the devil? We have realized, no, we are not fighting the devil. So what are we supposed to fight? Let's go back to uh, Ephesians chapter one, uh, chapter 6 from verse 10, uh, where we were, Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 10. And the Bible says, Finally, brethren, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You realize that we are not called to fight the devil. We are called to stand against the wiles of the devil, against the schemes of the devil, against the plans and the lies and the deception of the devil. Let me remind you something. From the old time, from, the, from creation, from the fall of man, the tool that the devil greatly uses is called lies and deception. And even today, that is what he uses. He does not have any other weapon but that which we give him. So what, has, what do I mean by that? The devil has been disarmed. He doesn't have power and authority over your life. But the only way he can have that power and authority over your life is when you give in to his lies. Is when you give in to his deception. When you give in, you give in to his uh, uh, to his trickeries because the devil is a trickery devil. He is a he is a schemer. Praise God. Now the Bible says that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Again, it's not to fight the devil. It is to stand against the wiles of the devil. That is why I'm calling this part of the book of Ephesians the, uh, the, the standing position. Hallelujah. Then there is something that is very important in uh, verse 11 as we begin. It says, put on the whole armor of God. And before maybe I explain that, we can go to verse 14 and see what he, is talking, what he means by the armor of God. And this is the, the whole armor of God from that, verse 13. He says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So the ultimate goal is to remain standing. The ultimate vision from God is to have you remain standing. It is true things will come your way, but there is a way to remain standing no matter what comes. But he talks about the whole armor of God. And he says from verse 14, start therefore having you guarded your waist with the truth. So the first uh, uh, of, the armor of, of the armor of God is the truth. Then he says, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil, of the wicked one. And verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I want to show you something. In verse, uh, verse 11, he says, put on the whole armor of God. 
Then verse 14, start there for having guarded you, and he explains the, the, the weapons of warfare or the, the full armor of God. So when he says put on, it's not like something that you don't have, you're being told to put it on. No, all these things, having gone through Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, we have realized that all these things, we have them. For example, he talks about having guarded your waist with truth. What is truth? Truth is Christ. Remember in John chapter 14 verse 6 he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when he talks about putting on the armor of truth, he is saying switch on because that is what is already in you. You already have that because you are a believer. Assuming Because Paul is assuming that you are already a believer. And I said you cannot, uh, uh, this spiritual warfare cannot be fought or cannot Cannot uh, no uh, an unbeliever or unbelievers cannot get into this thing we are calling spiritual warfare. It's only for believers, and for believers you have been established in this that you have Christ in you. The Bible says that to all that believed in Him, to them gave He power to become sons of God. It also says that. This is the mystery that was hidden for ages, which is Christ in us. So if he so, he talks about putting on. Uh, our the, uh, or guarding our ways with truth, he is he is talking about switching on because this is something that we already have. Having our minds focused on this reality, having our minds focused on the truth, which is Christ, which is the Word of God. Again, so it's not something that you, that you are picking from heaven. These are not weapons that we come and pray. Oh, God said the truth from heaven. No, these are realities that we already have in Christ. So you realize why you first must be established. Uh, in what Paul was talking previously. Then he says, the, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Again, righteousness is not something that you work for. It is not something that you are asking God to give you. It's something for you that believes you have it already. It's called the breastplate of righteousness. And I was asking myself why he called it the breastplate of righteousness. You see, uh, the breastplate of righteousness uh, talks about uh, uh, shielding or covering your breast or your, your breast area or your, or your chest for that case. And that is to say that sometimes, you know, that is where your heart is. So the, the enemy comes in to attack you in that area in this way. He wants to attack you by telling you how you are not righteous, how you are not worthy. He condemns you. You know, that is how the devil fights. The devil does not have any other we weapon but lies. He comes and lies to you and tells you because of this and this and this you've been doing, you are not righteous. So he is condemning you. He is attacking you. He is attacking uh, your heart. But having the breastplate of God's righteousness, this is not your own righteousness. This is the righteousness of God. So when you have it, even when the enemy condemns you, you know that you are more than a victor. You know that you are the righteousness of God. You know the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 verse 1 that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are where? Those who are in Christ Jesus. So righteousness is a weapon. Righteousness is a great armor to avoid any kind of attack that attacks your stand with God. Because again, righteousness, the, the, the word righteous means, righteousness means having a right standing with God. Praise be to God. So when, uh, when you are attacked, it means uh, the enemy wants to attack your stand with God by telling you that you have been doing this and this so you don't have a right standing with God. He wants to attack your relationship with God. But when you put on in your mind, when you put on in your mind the breastplate of righteousness and understand this truth that you are the righteousness of God, so that is to say, whatever comes to attack your standing with God, whatever comes to attack your relationship with God, you know that you know that you know in your knower that you are the righteousness of God. And remember, he says, even in the, the book of 1 John, that even when your heart condemns you, because there are times when you feel like you are your heart, your own heart is condemning you and telling you you've not been good enough, you've not been praying enough, you've not been, uh, you've not been giving enough. So those are attacks from the enemy just to pull you down through condemnation. But when he attacks you in that way, you have 
the righteousness of God. He says, even when our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart. And he knows all things. What does he know? He knows that he has made you righteous. Then he talks about having shod your feet to the preparation of the gospel of peace. That is to, to say that you are always ready to preach the gospel of peace, to declare the peace of God. The Bible says that in a God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And now he has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. That is what we call the gospel of peace. That uh, you are at peace with God and wherever you go, you make people to be at peace with God by preaching the gospel. Then he talks about, above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Faith. Now he's talking about faith. What is faith? Faith is acknowledging and taking the word of God as true. So faith, then the, the other one he talks about, he talks about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. All these things, they are not new. They are not strange to a believer. You already have them in Christ Jesus. Praise be to God. So then he says, uh, the, the, the main reason he's talking about this is so that having done all, you remain standing. Hallelujah. So uh, uh, there is something else I said that but the battlefield is in the mind. You know, even when Jesus was being tempted, uh, you know, sometimes I, I, I don't like the, the, the movies that we watch, like uh, the Passion of Christ. Because in the Passion of Christ, we see a snake coming to talk to Jesus and tempting him. If you are the son of God, change these stones to bread. You know, it was not a snake. <laughs> All these things were happening in his mind because the battlefield is in the mind. Praise be to God. So the enemy knows that he cannot attack you in any other way. And if he is able to attack your mind by giving you lies, by lying to you, by deceiving you, then he got you. Anyone who got your mind got you. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, that as a man thinketh, so is he. So the greatest place that the enemy wants to attack is your mind. And how does he attack your mind? By deceiving, by bringing lies to your mind. Praise be to God. Let me show you a scripture, then I explain it as we, as we, as we continue. In the book of uh, Corinthians chapter 10, Corinthians chapter 10, uh, Corinthians chapter 10, yes, from verse, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, from verse 3. I'm reading from the New King James Version. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Now, we're getting into warfare. <laughs> for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So we've talked about the whole armor of God. So this, this armor of God is mighty in God. So righteousness is not carnal. So the righteousness we are talking about here is not your own carnal righteousness, not the righteousness that you have worked for. It's, it is not as a result of you praying or you giving or you doing anything. It is not a result of you doing anything. It is not a carnal righteousness. It's a God-given righteousness. So he talks about they are not carnal but mighty in God. So all the weapons of warfare, the, the, the truth, the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith, all these, they are mighty in God. Hallelujah. And what is their purpose? For pulling down strongholds. Now, that is a very big word. When people hear of strongholds, they think about things that are in the air, things that we need to pull down. There is a stronghold that has covered this area. We need to pull it down. You know, there is a stronghold of witchcraft. You know, all those things that people think about. But what is a stronghold? A stronghold is a thought, is a thought pattern that holds a person strongly. Praise God. <laughs> that holds a person strongly. Follow me. Then verse 5 says, Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So he talks about pulling down strongholds and casting down arguments. You know, I say that the battlefield of a believer is in the mind. For example, you know what the word of God says, but in the mind there is argument about it. Now, warfare is allowing your mindset, allowing your mind 
to come to terms with the reality of the word. Allowing your mind to come to terms with the reality of the spirit. Because the spirit is who you are in Christ. You know, the mind of a believer was not made new. When you got born again, your mind was not made new. Actually, the rest part of life of a believer is spent transforming or renewing their minds. When you got born again, your mind did not get born again. Your body did not get born again. It is your spirit that got born again. That is why if you are tall, you remain to be tall. If you are dark, you remain to be dark. If you are a foolish person, you remain to be a foolish person if you are, because your mind never changed. But now, the second part of the journey of a believer after getting born again, because when you get born again, in your spirit you become just like God. In your spirit you become like God, 100% like God. The Bible says complete, perfect, you are a new creation. It is not your body that is new. It is not your mind that is new. It is your spirit that is new. Now, spiritual warfare is your mind agreeing with your spirit because in the spirit you are as righteous as God. In your spirit you are as whole as God. In your spirit you are as complete as God. But now your mind comes and tells you I am not perfect. Your mind comes and tells you I am not righteous. Your mind comes and tells you I am not holy. Your mind joins with your body and tells you that I am sick. You see, those are two, it's called the civil war in a man, the civil war in the mind of a man, where the spirit says you're complete, but the, the, uh, the soul, that is the mind and your body, says the contrary. Now, that is where we have the battlefield, because your mind got to be allowed to align with the spirit. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Conformity is allowing your mind to be shaped by the realities of this world. Conformity is allowing your mind to be shaped by what is surrounding you. Conformity is allowing your mind to be shaped by the thought patterns of this world. But it says, do not be conformed, but be ye transformed. Conformity is carnality. Transformation is spirituality. Hallelujah. And how are, we, uh, how are we transformed when our minds are renewed? You know, I've said, your spirit is a new creation. You that believes in Christ, you are a new creation. You are new. But now your mind got to be renewed, got to align with the reality of the spirit. Let's, let, uh, let's uh, continue. It says, casting down arguments and every hiding that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. This is the totality of spiritual warfare. There are arguments that are going on in your mind. I believe there are so many people that cannot agree with the reality that they are the righteousness of God. There are so many people, even today, as I as we share the word of God and tell them that they have been made righteous, that they are they belong to God, that God loves them. In their minds, there is something telling them, no, I need to do something about my righteousness. I need to do something to be holy. I need to do something to be in good books with God. Now that is what we call a uh, spiritual warfare. And Paul also calls it, as he is addressing Timothy, he calls it the good fight of faith. So he's, he talks about pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. There is something called the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is the realities of your spirit, is the realities of the word of God. There are so many things that come into your mind to uh, to exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. There is what you know about God. You know God loves you, but there is a mindset that tells you that God is angry with you. Now that is what we call, uh, we, that is what we need to pull down. That is what we need to cast down. He says, bringing every thought into the captivity to the obedience of Christ. Hallelujah. That is to talk about uh, obedience of Christ. You mean you, you know your mind needs to be brought down to the obedience of Christ. What is the obedience obedience of Christ? You no know, many people think like when we are talking about obedience of Christ, we are talking about obedience to the law. No, 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 no. The obedience of Christ is believing what Christ 
has done for you. One day, the disciples asked Jesus in the book of John chapter 6 from verse 28 and 29. They asked Jesus, now, what do we do to do the works of God? So, in other words, they were asking Jesus, how do we obey God? And this is what Jesus responded in verse 29 of John chapter 6. This is the only way to be obedient to the works of God. How? By believing in him that he has sent. So the obedience of Christ, bringing every thought to the obedience of Christ means to bring every thought to believe in what Christ has done for them. Bringing every thought to understand and to align with what Christ has done for them. Like your body may be telling you that you are sick and you are going to die. Now warfare is here. You need to allow your mind and you must uh, bring that thought of that is telling you how bad you are, how bad your condition is. You must bring it to the subjection of the obedience of Christ. You must bring it to, uh, uh, to believe in what Christ has done for you. So when such thoughts come to your mind, you must speak the contrary. You must speak the word of God and say, I am healed. That is why he says that let the poor say, I am rich. It's not like we are lying. It's like we are bringing our thoughts to the obedience of Christ, to the belief, to the faith of Christ. He says, let the weak say, I am strong. So what you need to do when you experience such things, when you, uh, your mind is contrary to the reality of the spirit, you have to speak. You have to speak the word of God concerning your life. When you are, you are, your body is aching, the warfare demands that you speak the word of God. That is what we call spiritual warfare. It is not fighting about the, it is not fighting against the devil. It's about standing against his lies. Because every day when you wake up, the devil will come to you and haunt you with lies, telling you you are good for nothing, telling you that you are unworthy, telling you that you cannot make it, telling you that you don't deserve the, uh, the blessing of God, telling you that you don't deserve the glory of God, telling you that you don't deserve to be healed. All those are lies because we know that by the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. We know that our sins were forgiven. Praise be to God. So the devil will come to tell you that because of your sins, God is angry at you or God, God is mad at, mad at you. But you have to come and, at, uh, and bring those thoughts. You have to attack those ideas of the enemy and let him know that you belong to Jesus and you are more than a conqueror. So my brothers and my sisters, there is so much to say about spiritual warfare, but as you conclude, I want you to know this, that spiritual warfare is about aligning your mindset with the word of God. What does the word of God say about you? What does the, uh, the scripture say about you? That is the reality of who you are. Your mind may, may you know, the Paul said that in my, uh, my, uh, my heart, in my spirit, I am willing, but my mind is unable. I don't have the ability to do what I am willing. But now in Christ, you have to align your mindset to the reality of the word of God because the word of God says that now uh, he is the one who works in you both to do and to will according to his good pleasure. So no matter what the enemy is telling you, you don't have to fight him. You just need to stand your ground. You just need to stand in your position that I am the righteousness of God. I am whole. I am more than a conqueror. No matter what comes my way, I know Christ conquered for me. I know that I am healed. Sickness is not my portion. You don't have to fight the enemy because he has been fought and he has been won and he has been conquered. Now the battlefield is in your mind. Let your mind align with the reality of the word of God. Hallelujah. Let your mind, uh, let your mind be be changed. Let your perception do not see according to the systems of this world. Do not see according to the, uh, do not focus on the things of this world, but focus on the reality of the word of God. Allow the word of God to shape your mind because you're born of the word. Let the word of God culture you. Let the word of God shape you and let the word of God be your life. Praise be to God because you are not what the situations of the devil say you are. You are what the Bible says you are. And thank you for being with me. You are blessed because you have followed all through and I call you blessed. This has been Beholding Christ program and my name is Ben Fetcher. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for, uh, for revealing us uh, revealing to us your word. I will pray that by the word our minds will be transformed, will be renewed, that our lives will be moved from glory to another glory. We thank you because we are loved of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you for watching. God bless you. Amen.